The Prophecies and Revelations of St. Bridget of Sweden Mary, the mother of God, spoke to the Bride of Christ and said, My daughter, consider the suffering of my son, for his limbs were like my own limbs and his heart like my own heart. For just as other children used to be carried in the womb of their mother, so was he in me. But he was conceived through the burning charity of God's love. Others, however, are conceived through the lust of the flesh. Thus, John the Evangelist, his cousin, rightly says, The Word was made flesh. He came through love and was in me. The Word and love created him in me. He was truly for me like my own heart. For when I gave birth to him, I felt as though half my heart was born and went out of me. And when he endured suffering, it felt like my own heart was suffering. Just as when something is half inside and half outside, the half outside feels pain and suffering, but the inside also feels a similar pain, so it was for me when my son was scourged and wounded. It was as if my own heart was scourged and wounded. I was also the one closest to him at his suffering, and I was never separated from him. I stood very near his cross, and just like that which is closest to the heart stings the worst, so his pain was heavier and worse for me than for others. When he looked at me from the cross and I saw him, then tears flowed from my eyes like blood from veins. And when he saw me so stricken with pain and overwhelming sorrow, he felt such a sorrow over my pain that all the pain of his own wounds became as subsided and dead for the sake of the pain he saw in me. I can therefore boldly say that his pain was my pain since his heart was my heart. For just as Adam and Eve sold the world for an apple, so my son and I bought back the world as with one heart. Consider therefore, my daughter, how I was at the death of my son, and it will not be hard for you to give up the world and her cares. An angel was praying for his Lord's bride and our Lord answered him, You are like a knight of the Lord who never took off his helmet for the sake of sloth and who never turned his eyes away from the battle for the sake of fear. You are steadfast as a mountain and burning like a flame. You are so pure that there is no stain in you. You beg me to have mercy on my bride. You know and see all things in me. Nevertheless, while she is listening, tell me what kind of mercy you are asking for her, for mercy is namely threefold. One is the mercy by which the body is punished and tortured and the soul is spared, as it happened with my servant Job, whose flesh had to suffer all kinds of pain and torment, but whose soul was protected. The second mercy is the one by which soul and body are spared from torment, as it was in the case of the king who lived in all sorts of lust and worldly pleasure, and had no pain either in body or soul while he lived in the world. The third mercy is the one by which soul and body are punished, so that they have distress in their flesh and sorrow in their heart, as it happened with Peter and Paul and other saints. For there are three states for humans in the world. The first state is that of those who fall into sin and get up again. These do I sometimes allow to suffer in their bodies so that they may be saved. The second state is that of those who would gladly live forever to be able to sin forever, and who have all of their will and thought directed to the world, and if they do anything for me at any time, they do it with the intention of their worldly possessions growing and prospering. Neither punishment of the body nor very much pain of the heart is given to these people, but instead they are allowed to follow their own power and will because they will receive a reward here for the least little good they have done for me to then be tormented for all eternity. For since their will to sin is everlasting, their torment shall also be everlasting. The third state is that of those who are more afraid of sinning against me and offending me than they fear any torment. They would rather endure to be tortured with unbearable pain in eternity than consciously provoke me to wrath. Sorrow of body and heart are given to these men as with Peter and Paul and other saints, so that they may amend for all their sins in this world, or so that they may be chastised for a time for the sake of their greater glory and as an example to others. I have shown this threefold mercy to three persons in this kingdom whose names are well known to you. But now, my angel and servant, tell me, for what kind of mercy do you pray for my bride? He answered, I pray for the mercy of her soul and body so that she may amend for all her sins in this world, and so that none of her sins may come before your judgment. Our Lord answered, May it be done according to your will. Then he said to the bride, You are mine and I will do with you as I please. Love nothing as much as me. Purify yourself constantly from sin every hour according to the advice of those I have entrusted you to. 
Hide no sin. Leave nothing unexamined. Do not consider any sin to be light or worthy of disregard. For anything you forget, I will remind you of and judge. None of the sins you have done will come before my judgment if they are punished and expiated through your penance while you live. But those sins for which you made no penance will be purged either in purgatory or by some secret judgment of mine, unless you make a full satisfaction and amendment for them here in the world. The Queen of Heaven said, My son had three good things. The first one was that no one ever had such a beautiful body as he did, since he had two perfect natures, namely, his divinity and manhood. His body was so pure that, just as no stain can be found in the clearest of eyes, so not a single defect could be found on his body. The second good was that he never sinned. Other children, however, sometimes bear the sins of their parents, and sometimes their own. But he never sinned and yet bore the sins of everyone. The third good was that some men die for the sake of God and to receive a greater reward. But he died just as much for the sake of his enemies as for me and his friends. When his enemies crucified him, they did four things to him. First, they crowned him with a crown of thorns. Second, they pierced his hands and feet. Third, they gave him gall to drink. Fourth, they pierced his side. But now I complain that the enemies of my son, who are now in the world, crucify him more cruelly in a spiritual sense than the Jews who crucified his body. For even though the divinity is unable to suffer and die, still they crucify him through their own vices and sins. For if a man insults and injures an image of his enemy, the image does not feel the damage done to it. Nevertheless, the perpetrator should be accused and judged for his evil intention to do harm as though it was a deed. In the same way, the vices and sins by which they crucify my son spiritually are more abominable and heavy to him than the vices of those who crucified his body. But now you may ask, how do they crucify him? First off, they fasten him on the cross they have prepared for him when they do not heed the commandments of their Creator and Lord, but dishonor him when he warns them through his servants to serve him, and they despise this and instead do what pleases them. Then they crucify his right hand when they hold justice to be as injustice, saying, Sin is not so heavy and abominable to God as it is said. God does not punish anyone for all eternity. He only threatens us with these hard things to scare us. Why else would he redeem man if he wanted us to perish? They do not consider that the least little sin a man finds delight in is enough to damn him to an eternal torment, and that God does not let the least little sin go unpunished, just like he does not let the least little good deed go unrewarded. Therefore, they shall be tormented for all eternity because of their constant intention of sinning, and my son, who sees the heart, counts that as a deed. For they would fulfill their will with deeds if my son tolerated or allowed it. Then they crucify his left hand when they turn virtue into sin and the will to continue in sin until the end, saying, If we just once say at the end of our life, O God, have mercy on me, God's mercy is so great that we will be forgiven. But this is not virtue to want to sin without bettering oneself, and wanting to receive a reward without having to work for it. Not unless a real contrition is found in the heart that the man wants to change if only he could do so were it not for illness or some other hindrance. Thereafter, they crucify his feet when they take pleasure in sinning without once thinking of my son's bitter suffering or without once thanking him from their inmost heart with words like these, My Lord and God, how bitter your suffering was, praise and honor be to you for your death such words are never heard from their mouth. They then crown him with the crown of derision when they mock his servants, and consider it useless to serve him. They give him gall to drink when they rejoice in glory and sin, and not once does the thought arise in their heart of how grave and manifold and dangerous this sin is. They pierce his side when they have the will to continue in sin. In truth, I tell you and you can say this to my friends that such people are more unjust in the sight of my son than those who judged him, more unkind than those who crucified him, more shameless than those who sold him and they shall therefore receive a greater torment than the others. Pilate knew very well that my son had not sinned and did not deserve to die. But he, nonetheless, felt compelled to judge my son to death because he feared the loss of his worldly power and the revolt of the Jews. But what would these have to fear if they served my son, or what honor or dignity would they lose if they honored him? They will therefore be judged with a more severe sentence than Pilates. 
for they are worse than him in my son's sight. For Pilate judged him because of the request, and will of others and due to fear. But these judge him for their own advantage, and without any fear when they dishonor him by committing the sin that they could abstain from if they wanted. But they do not abstain from sin nor are they ashamed of the sins that they have done. For they do not consider that they are unworthy of the good deeds of the one whom they do not serve. They are also worse than Judas. For when Judas had betrayed his Lord, he knew very well that he was God and that he had sinned heavily against him. But he despaired and hastened his days toward hell, thinking himself to be unworthy to live. But these know their sin very well and yet they continue in it without feeling any remorse about it in their hearts. They want to take the kingdom of heaven with violence and power when they think they can get it, not through their good deeds but through a vain hope. But it is only given to those who work and suffer something for the sake of God. They are also worse than those who crucified my son. For when these saw the good works of my son, namely, the raising of the dead and the cleansing of leapers, they thought to themselves, This man does unheard of and extraordinary miracles. He overcomes anyone he wants with a word. He knows all our thoughts, and he does whatever he wants. If he is successful, we will all have to submit to his power and become his subjects. Therefore, in order to avoid being subjected to him, they crucified him because of their envy. But if they had known that he was the king of glory, they never would have crucified him. But these people see his great deeds and miracles every day, and they take advantage of his good deeds and hear how they should serve him and come to him. But they think to themselves, If we must leave all our temporal belongings and follow his will and not our own, it would be heavy and unbearable. They despise his will so that it should not be placed over their own will, and crucify my son through their hardened heart when they add sin upon sin against their conscience. They are worse than those who crucified my son, for the Jews did it for the sake of envy and because they did not know that he was God. But these know him to be God, and yet, in their own malice and presumption and greed, they crucify him spiritually more cruelly than the Jews did physically. For they themselves have been redeemed, but the Jews had not yet been redeemed. Therefore, my bride, obey my son and fear him, for just as he is merciful, he is also just. The father spoke to the son, saying, I came with love to the virgin and took your true body from her. You are therefore in me and I in you. Just as fire and heat are never separated, so it is impossible to separate the divinity from the manhood. The Son answered, May all glory and honor be to you, Father. May your will be done in me and mine in you. The Father answered him again, Behold, my Son, I am entrusting this new bride to you like a sheep to be guided and educated. As the owner of the sheep, you will get from her cheese to eat and milk to drink and wool to clothe yourself with. But you, bride, should obey him. You have three things you must do. You have to be patient, obedient, and willing to do what is good. Then the Son said to the Father, Your will with power, power with humility, humility with wisdom, wisdom with mercy. May your will be done, which is and always will be without beginning nor end in me. I take her to myself into my love, into your power and into the guidance of the Holy Spirit, which are not three gods but one God. Then the Son said to his bride, you have heard how the Father entrusted you to me like a sheep. You must therefore be simple-minded and patient like a sheep and fruitful in producing food and clothing. Three people are in the world. The first is completely naked, the second is thirsty, and the third is hungry. The first signifies the faith of my church, and it is naked because everyone is ashamed and afraid to speak of the true faith and of my commandments. And if some people do speak or teach about such things, they are despised and accused of being liars. Therefore, my words which proceed from my mouth should clothe this faith like wool. For just as wool grows on the body of a sheep by the heat, so too my words proceed from the heat of my divinity and manhood to your heart. They will clothe my holy faith with the testimony of truth and wisdom and prove that the faith which is now regarded as vain is true, so that the ones who, up to now, have been lazy in clothing their faith in deeds of love after hearing my words of love, will be converted and enkindled again in order to speak with certitude of faith and act with power. The second one signifies my friends who have a thirsting desire to make my honor perfect and are saddened at my dishonor. They shall be filled with the sweetness that they heard in my words and enkindled with a greater love for me 
and along with them, others who are now dead in sin, will also be enkindled in my love, when they hear of the mercy I have done with sinners. The third one signifies those who think thus in their hearts. If only we knew the will of God and how we should live, and if anyone taught us about the good way, we would gladly do what we could for the honor of God. These are hungry to get to know my way and will, but no one feeds them, since no one shows them completely what they should do, and if they are shown or taught what to do, no one lives according to the words with their deeds. And for this reason, the words seem as dead to them. Therefore, I myself shall show and teach them what they should do, and I will fill them with my sweetness. For worldly things, which are seen and desired now almost by everyone, cannot fill mankind but only arouse his desire and greed of the world to win more and more things. But my words and my love will feed men and fill them with an overflowing consolation. Therefore, my bride, who are my sheep, you must take great care to keep your patience and obedience. You are all mine by right and should therefore follow my will. The one who wants to follow the will of another should have three things. First, he should have the same will and opinion as the other. Second, have similar deeds. Third, he should move away from his enemies. But who are my enemies if not pride and every sin? You should therefore move away from them, if you desire to follow my will. The Son of God said, I had three things in my death. First, faith. When I bent my knees and prayed to the Father, knowing that He was able to save me from the suffering. Second, hope, when I steadfastly waited and said, Not as I will. Third, love, when I said, Thy will be done. I also had bodily agony from the natural fear of suffering when the sweat of blood went out of my body. Thus, in order that my friends should not fear that they are abandoned when the moment of tribulation comes to them, I showed them in myself that the weak flesh always flees from suffering. But now you may ask how the sweat of blood went out of my body. Just like the blood of a sick person dries up and is consumed in all his veins, so was my blood consumed by the natural fear of death. My father wanted to show the way by which heaven would be opened and the exiled man to be able to enter therein. And therefore he delivered me out of love to my suffering in order that my body would be glorified in honor after the suffering had been fulfilled. For justice did not allow my manhood to enter into glory without suffering, although I was able to do so by the power of my divinity. How then should those deserve to enter into my glory who have little faith, vain hope, and no love? If they believed in the eternal joy of heaven and in the horrific torments of hell, they would desire nothing but me. If they believe that I see and know all things and have power over all things and that I demand a judgment over all, they would hate the world, and they would fear more to sin before me than before men. If they had a firm and steadfast hope, then their every thought and desire would be directed toward me. If they had a divine love for me, then they would at least think in their soul about what I did for their sake, how much I labored in preaching, how great my pain was in my suffering, and how great my love was at my death when I preferred to die rather than to lose and forsake them. But their faith is sick and wavering, threatening to fall soon, because they believe only when suffering and temptation does not attack them, and they lose their hope as soon as they are met with adversity. Their hope is vain, because they hope that their sin will be forgiven without justice and a right judgment. They hope with self-reliance to receive the kingdom of heaven for nothing and wish to receive my mercy without the severity of justice. Their love for me is completely cold, for they are never enkindled in seeking or calling me unless they are forced to it by tribulation. How can I be warmed by such people who have either a right faith nor a firm hope nor a burning love for me? And therefore, when they cry out to me and say, O God, have mercy on me, they do not deserve to be heard or to enter into my glory since they did not want to follow their Lord in suffering, and therefore, they should not follow him to the glory. For no knight can please his Lord and be taken back into his mercy after his fall, unless he first humbles himself in penance for his contempt. I am your Creator and Lord. Answer me on the three things I am going to ask you. How is the state of the house where the wife is dressed like a lady and her husband like a slave? Is this right? She answered in her conscience, No, Lord, it is not right. Our Lord said, I am the Lord of all things and the King of angels. I dress my servant, namely, my manhood, with only usefulness and necessity, for I desired nothing from this world except meager food and clothing. But you, who are my bride, want to live like a lady, 
and wish to have wealth and honor and be held in honor. What is the benefit of all these things? All things are indeed vanity, and all things must be left. Mankind was not created for any superfluity, but only to have what the necessity of nature requires. This superfluity was invented by pride, and it is now held and loved as the law. Second, tell me if it is right for the man to work from morning to evening and then for the wife to spend everything that has been gathered in a single hour? She answered, No, this is not right. The wife is instead obliged to live and act after the will of her man. Our Lord said, I acted like the man who works from morning to evening, for from my youth up to the time of my suffering, I worked in showing the way to heaven by preaching and by fulfilling what I preached with deeds. But the wife, that is, the soul, who should be like my wife, wastes all my work when she lives frivolously so that nothing of what I have done and suffered for her sake can benefit her, nor do I find any virtue in her in which I can delight in. Third, tell me, is it not wrong and abominable for the master of the house to be despised and for the slave to be honored? She answered, Yes, it indeed is. Our Lord said, I am the Lord of all things. My house is the world, and mankind should, by right, be my servant. But I, the Lord, am now despised in the world and the man honored. Therefore shall you, whom I have chosen, take care to do my will, because everything in the world is nothing but sea foam and a false dream. I am the creator of all things. I was born of the Father before Lucifer. I am inseparably in the Father, and the Father in me and one Spirit in us both. Accordingly, there is one God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and not three gods. I am the one who promised the eternal inheritance to Abraham and led my people out of Egypt through Moses. I am the one who spoke through the prophets. The Father sent me to the womb of the Virgin without separating himself from me but remaining inseparably with me so that mankind, who had abandoned God, would return to God through my love. But now, in your presence, my heavenly host, although you see and know all things in me, yet for the sake of the knowledge and teaching of my bride standing here, who cannot understand spiritual things except through a corporal parable. I make a complaint before you over these five men who are standing here, for they provoke me to wrath in many ways. Just as I once, in the law, with the name of Israel, signified the whole Israelite nation, so now by these five men I signify every man in the world. The first man signifies the leader of the church and his priests, the second, the evil lady, the third, the Jews, the fourth, the heathens, and the fifth, my friends. But from you, Jew, I exclude all the Jews who are Christians in secret and who serve me secretly in a pure love, a right faith, and a perfect deed. And from you, heathen, I exclude all those who would gladly walk in the way of my commandments, if they only knew and were taught how they should walk and live, and who with their deeds do as much as they know and are able. These shall by no means be judged with you, I now complain over you, O head of my church, who sit on my seat which I gave to Peter and his successors to sit on with a threefold dignity and power, first, so that they would have the power of binding and loosing souls from their sins, second, so that they would open heaven for the penitent, third, so that that they would close heaven to the damned and to those who despise my law. But you, who should be healing souls and presenting them to me, you are in truth a murderer of souls. I appointed Peter as shepherd and guardian of my sheep. But you, however, scatter and wound them. You are worse than Lucifer. For he was envious of me and desired to kill none but me so that he could rule in my place. But you are so much worse, for you do not only kill me by driving me off from yourself by your bad deeds, but you also kill souls by your bad example. I redeemed the souls with my blood and entrusted them to you as to a faithful friend but you deliver them back again to the enemy from whom I redeemed them. You are more unrighteous than Pilate. He judged no one else but me to death, but you not only judge me as if I were a powerless lord and worthy of no good thing, no, you also judge and condemn the souls of the innocent and let the guilty go free without any rebuke. You are more cruel than Judas who only sold me, but you not only sell me, but also the souls of my chosen men for your own shameful profit, and vain names' sake. You are more despicable than the Jews, for they only crucified my body. But you crucify and torture the souls of my chosen men for whom your malice and your sins are more bitter than from any wound from a sword. 
And so, since you are like Lucifer and more unrighteous than Pilate and more cruel than Judas and more despicable than the Jews, I complain over you with justice. To the second man, that is, to the lady, our Lord said, I created all things for your benefit. You gave your consent to me and I to you. You gave me your faith and promised by oath that you would serve me. But now, you have deserted me like a man who does not know his God. You hold my words for a lie and my deeds as vanity, and you say that my wool and my commandments are too heavy. You have violated the faith you promised me. You have broken your oath and abandoned my name. You have separated yourself from the number of my saints, and have come to belong to the number of the devils, and you have become their friend. You think that no one is worthy of praise and honor but yourself. Everything that belongs to me and that you are bound to do for me appears heavy and bitter for you, but the things that please yourself are very easy for you. Therefore, I complain over you with right, for you have broken the faith you gave me in baptism and later, and for the love I have shown you in word and deed, you mock me and call me a liar, and for my suffering you call me a fool. To the third man, that is, to the Jews, he said, I began my deed of love with you and I chose you as my people. I led you out of slavery, I gave you my law, I brought you into the land I had promised your fathers, and I sent you prophets to console you. Thereafter, I chose a virgin for myself from among you from which I assumed manhood. But now I complain over you since you do not want not believe in me. But say, the Christ has not yet come, he is still to be expected. Our Lord said to the fourth man, that is, to the heathens, I created and redeemed you like the Christian man and I created all good things for your sake. But you are like a man out of his senses, because you do not know what you are doing. You are also like a blind man, because you do not see where you are going. You honor and worship the created things instead of the Creator, and the false instead of the true, and you bend your knee before things that have less worth than yourself. That is why I complain about you. To the fifth man, he said, My friend, come closer. And he directly said to the heavenly hosts, my beloved friends, I have a friend with which I signify and mean many friends. He is like a man trapped among evil people and harshly shackled in captivity. If he speaks the truth, they beat his mouth with stones. If he does something good, they thrust a spear into his breast. Alas, my friends and saints, how long shall I endure such men, and how long shall I tolerate such contempt? St. John the Baptist answered, You are like the most pure mirror. For we see and know all things in you as in a mirror without any help of words and speech. You are the sweetness that no one can describe in which we taste all good things. You are like the sharpest of swords for you judge in righteousness. Our Lord answered him, Indeed, my friend, you said the truth, for my chosen men see all goodness and righteousness in me, and even the evil spirits see it in their own conscience but not in the light. Just like a man placed in a dark prison, who had earlier learned the letters, knows that which he had learned before even though he is in darkness and currently cannot see, so it is with the devils. Even though they do not see my righteousness in the light of my clarity, they still know and see it in their conscience. I am also like a sword that separates things into two parts. In this way I give each and every person what they deserve. Then our Lord said to Saint Peter, You are the founder and defender of the faith and of my church. While my host is listening, State the sentence of the five men. Peter answered, O Lord, all praise and honor to you for the love you have shown to your earth. Blessed be you by all your hosts, for you allow us to see and know all things in you that have been and will be, and that is why we see and know all things in you. It is true justice that the first man who sits upon your seat, while having the deeds of Lucifer, should shamefully lose the seat he dared to sit on and become a partaker in the torment of Lucifer. The right judgment of the second man is that he, who has fallen away from your faith, should fall down to hell with his head down and feet up, for he loved himself and despised you who should have been his head. The right judgment of the third man is that he will not see your face, and that he should be tormented for his malice and greed, since unbelievers do not deserve to see your glory and beauty. The right judgment of the fourth is that he should be locked up like a man out of his senses and banished to the city of darkness. The right judgment of the fifth is that help should be sent to him. Then our Lord answered, I swear by God the Father, whose voice John the Baptist heard in the Jordan, I swear by the body which John baptized, saw, 
and touched in the Jordan. I swear by the Holy Spirit who revealed himself in the form of a dove at the Jordan, that I shall do justice with these five men. Then our Lord said to the first of these five men, The sword of my severity will go into your body. It shall enter at the top of your head and penetrate you so deeply and violently that it can never be drawn out. Your chair will sink like a heavy stone and never stop before it comes to the lowest of depths. Your fingers, that is, your assistants and advisors, will burn in the inextinguishable sulfurous fire. Your arms, that is, your office holders, who should have reached out for the help and benefit of souls but instead reached out for worldly honor and profit, will be judged to the torment and suffering of which David speaks. His sons shall be fatherless, and his wife a widow, and others shall take his property. Who is his wife if not the soul which shall be excluded from the glory of heaven, and be widowed and lose God? His sons, that is, the virtues they appear to have, and my simple and humble men who were under them, shall be separated from them. Their honor and property will be given to others, and they will inherit eternal shame instead of their dignity and glory. Their headgear will sink down into the filth of hell, and they will never be able to get up out of it. Just as they rose above others through their honor and pride, so in hell they will sink so much deeper than others so that it will be impossible for them to ever stand up again. Their limbs, that is, all the priests who followed and helped them in wickedness, will be cut off from them and severed just like the wall that is torn down where not a single stone is left upon another stone and the cement no longer adheres to the stones. No mercy will come to them, for my love will never warm them nor restore or build them up into an eternal house in heaven, but instead they shall be excluded from all good and endlessly tormented with their headmen and leaders. But to the second I say, since you do not want to keep the faith you promised me and have love toward me, I shall send an animal to you that will rise from the surging torrent, and it shall swallow you. Like the torrent always flows downward, so this animal will drag you down to the lowest hell. And just like it is impossible for you to travel upstream against the surging torrent, it will be just as hard for you to ever ascend from hell. To the third I say, Since you, Jew, do not want to believe that I have come, you will see me when I come on judgment day but not in my glory but in your conscience, and you will come to know that all the things I said were true. Then there is nothing left for you but to be tormented as you deserve. To the fourth I say, since you do not care to believe and do not want to know me, your darkness will become light for you, and your heart will be enlightened so that you may know that my judgments are true, but you will still not come to the light. To the fifth I say, I shall do three things to you. First, I shall fill you inwardly with my fervor. Second, I shall make your mouth harder and firmer than any stone, so that the stones turn back to the ones throwing them at you. Third, I shall arm you with my weapons so well that no spear will harm you, but instead everything will melt before you like wax in the heat of the fire. Be therefore made strong and stand like a man. For just like a knight in battle who hopes for help of his lord and continues fighting as long as he still has some life force in him, so may you too stand firm and fight like a man. For the Lord, your God, whom none are able to withstand, will give you help. And since your number is small, I will honor you and multiply you greatly. Behold, my friends, you see these things and know them in me, and in this way they stand before me. The words I have now spoken will be fulfilled. But these other men shall never enter my kingdom, as long as I am king, unless they better themselves. For heaven will only be given to those who humble themselves and to those who mourn over their sins with penance. Then all the host answered, Praise be to you, Lord God, who are without beginning and without end. The mother of God spoke, I had three things by which I pleased my son. First, humility in such a way that no created creature, whether angel or man, was more humble than I. Second, I had obedience, for I strove to obey my son in all things. Third, I had a special charity. For this reason I am honored threefold by my son. First, I have been made more honorable than angels and men, so that there is no virtue in God that does not shine in me, even though he is the source and beginning of all virtues and the creator of all things. But I, however, am the creature to whom he has given more grace than all others. Second, for my obedience I receive such power that there is no sinner so unclean that he will not receive forgiveness if he turns to me with a will and purpose of amendment, and a contrite heart for his sins. 
Third, for my charity, God is so close to me that the one who sees God sees me, and the one who sees me can see the divinity, and the manhood in me and me in God as though in a mirror. For the one who sees God, sees three persons in him, and the one who sees me, sees, as it were, three persons. For the divinity enclosed me in soul and body in himself, and filled me with every virtue, so that there is no virtue in God that does not shine and appear in me, although God himself is the Father and giver of all virtues. For as it is with two bodies joined together, that whatever one body receives the other body also receives, so God has done with me. There is no sweetness that is not found in me. It is like someone who has a sweet nut and gives a part of it to another. My soul and body are clearer than the sun and purer than a mirror, and just as three persons would be seen in the mirror if they stood near it, so the Father and Son and Holy Spirit may also be seen in my purity since I once had my Son in my womb with His divinity. He is now seen in me with His divinity and manhood as in a mirror, for I have been glorified with the honor and glory of the resurrection. Therefore may you, my Son's bride, strive to follow my humility and love nothing but my Son, the Son of God said to his bride, A great reward sometimes arises from a little good. The date palm has a wonderful smell, and in its fruit there is a stone. If it is planted in rich soil, it feels well, blossoms and makes good fruit and grows into a great tree. But if it is planted in dry soil, it dries out. Very dry and empty of all goodness is the soil that delights in sin, and it does not become better even if the seed of the virtues is sown in there. But rich is the soil of the mind that understands and confesses its sin and cries over their sin which has provoked their Creator to anger. If the date stone, that is, if the thought of my severe judgment and power is sown in such a mind, it immediately strikes three roots in the mind. The first one is that he thinks about how he can do nothing without my help, and for this reason he opens his mouth in prayer to me. The second is that he begins to give some small alms to me for the sake of my honor. The third is that he separates himself from worldly affairs in order to better serve me. He then begins to restrain himself from superfluities through daily fasting and abstains from and denies his own will and lust, and this is the trunk of the tree. After this, the branches of love grow when he leads and draws everyone he can toward the good. Then the fruit grows when he also instructs others in goodness as much as he can and with all piety tries to find ways of increasing my honor. Such a fruit is the best one and most pleasing to me. And so, from a small good, man rises up to perfection. When he first takes root through a little piety, the body grows through abstinence, the branches are multiplied through charity, and the fruit is increased through preaching. In the same way, a man falls down from a small evil to the greatest damnation and torment. Do you know what the heaviest burden is for the things that grow? Surely it is the child who is conceived but cannot be born and dies inside the womb of the mother. And because of this the mother also ruptures and dies, and the father carries her and the child to the grave and buries her with the rotting fetus. This is what the devil does to the soul. The iniquitous soul is indeed like the wife of the devil. She follows his will in everything, and she conceives a child with the devil when sin pleases her, and she rejoices in it. For just as a mother conceives a child and bears fruit through the little seed that is nothing but an unclean rottenness, so too, the soul bears much fruit for the devil when she delights in sin. Thereafter, the strength and limbs of the body get formed as sin gets added to sin and increases daily. When the sins increase, the mother swells up and wants to give birth, but cannot since her nature is consumed in sin, and her life becomes detestable. She would gladly desire to sin even more, but she cannot, and it is not allowed by God. Then the fear arrives because she cannot fulfill her will, and her strength and joy are gone. Pain and sorrow are everywhere. While she is now despairing of being able to do any good thing or any good deed, her womb ruptures, and she dies while blaspheming and insulting God's judgment and punishment. Then she is dragged by her father, the devil, down to the grave of hell where she is buried for all eternity with the rod of her sin and the child of her evil lust. Behold how sin increases from a small evil and grows unto damnation. I am the Creator and Lord of all things. I created the world and the world despises me. I hear a voice from the world like that of a bumblebee who gathers honey on the earth. For when a bumblebee is flying and begins to land on the ground, 
it emits a very raspy voice. I now hear this raspy and ignorant voice in the world, saying, I do not care what comes after this. In truth, now everyone is shouting, I do not care what comes after this and may I have my own will. Indeed, mankind does not care about what I did for the sake of love by preaching and suffering for them and by admonishing them through the prophets, and they do not care about what I did in my anger by executing my vengeance upon the evil and disobedient. They see that they are mortal and that death can strike them unexpectedly, but they do not care. They hear and see my justice which I exercised on Pharaoh and on Sodom for the sake of sin, and how I execute vengeance on other kings and rulers, and how I daily allow it to happen through the sword and other afflictions, but it is as if they were blind to all these things. And for this reason they fly like bumblebees wherever they desire, and sometimes they fly as if they were jumping and running, for they exalt themselves in their pride, but they come down quickly by returning to their lust and gluttony. They also gather sweetness for themselves from the earth. For man works and gathers for the needs of the body and not for the soul, and for worldly honor but not the eternal. They transform the temporal things into a suffering for themselves, and what is useless, into eternal torment. But for the sake of the prayers of my mother, I will send my clear voice to these bumblebees, from which my friends are excluded, for they are in the world only in body, and it shall preach mercy. If they will listen to it, they will be saved. The mother of God said, Bride of my son, clothe yourself and stand firm, for my son is approaching you. His flesh was pressed as in a winepress. For since mankind sinned in all limbs, my son made atonement in all his limbs. His hair was pulled out, his sinews extended, his joints were dislocated, his bones mangled, and his hands and feet were pierced through. His mind was saddened, his heart afflicted by sorrow, his intestines was forced and toward his back, for mankind had sinned in all limbs. Then the sun spoke, while the heavenly host was present, and he said, Although you know all things in me, still I speak for the sake of my bride standing here. I ask you, angels, what is it that was without beginning and shall be without end? And what is it that created everything and was created by none? Proclaim it and give your testimony. All the angels answered as with one voice and said, Lord, it is you. We give testimony to you about three things. First, that you are our creator and that you created all things in heaven and on earth. Second, that you are without beginning and will be without end, and your kingdom and power will stand for all eternity. Without you nothing has been created and without you nothing can be created. Third, we testify that we see all justice in you and all the things that have been and will be and all things are present to you without beginning or end. Then he said to the prophets and patriarchs, I ask you, who brought you out of slavery into freedom? Who divided the waters for you? Who gave you the law? Who gave you the prophetic spirit to speak about future things? They answered him, saying, You, Lord, you brought us out of slavery. You gave us the law. You moved our spirit to speak and prophesy about future things. Then he said to his mother, Give true testimony about what you know of me. She answered, Before the angel, whom you sent, came to me, I was alone in soul and body. But after the angel's words, your body was within me with divinity and manhood, and I felt your body in my body. I bore you without pain and suffering. I gave birth to you without anguish and travail. I wrapped you in poor clothes and I fed you with my milk. I was with you from your birth until your death. Thereafter he said to the apostles, Say who it was that you saw, heard, and touched. They answered, We heard your words and wrote them down. We heard and saw the great works that you did when you gave us the new law. You commanded the demons with one word to leave humans and they obeyed you and went out, and with your word you raised the dead and healed the sick. We saw you in a human body. We saw your great power and divine glory with your human nature. We saw you handed over to your enemies and we saw you hanging on the cross. We saw you suffer the most bitter pain, and we saw you be laid in the grave. We touched you when you were raised from the dead. We touched your hair and your face. We touched the place of your wounds and your limbs. You ate with us and you gave us your eloquence. You are truly the Son of God and the Son of the Virgin. We also observed when you ascended with your manhood to the right hand of the Father where you now are and will be without end. Then God said to the unclean demon spirits, 
Although you hide the truth in your conscience, still I now command you to say the truth about who it was that reduced your power. They answered him, Just like thieves do not tell the truth unless their feet are pressed in the hard wood, so we do not speak the truth unless we are forced by your divine and formidable power. You are the one who, with your power, descended into hell. You reduced our power in the world. You took out from hell what was yours by right, namely your friends. Then our Lord said, Behold, all those who have a spirit and are not clothed in a body, bear witness to the truth for me. But those who have a spirit and a body, namely humans, contradict me. Some know the truth of me but do not care about it. Others do not know it, and therefore, they do not care about it but say it is all false. He again said to the angels, They say that your witness is false, that I am not the creator of all things and that all things are not known in me. Therefore, they love the created things more than me, who am the creator. He said to the prophets, They contradict you and say that the law is useless, that you can be saved through your own power and wisdom, that the spirit was false, and that you spoke according to your own will. He said to his mother, Some say that you are not a virgin and others, that I did not take a body from you. Others know it but do not care about it. He said to the apostles, They contradict you, for they say that you are liars and that the new law is irrational and useless. Others believe it to be true but do not care about it. I ask you now, who will be their judge? They all answered him, saying, You, God, who are without beginning and without end. You, Jesus Christ, who are with the Father, to you is all judgment given by the Father, you are their judge. Our Lord answered, I who grieved for them am now their judge. But even though I know and can do all things still, give me your judgment over them. They answered him, Just as the whole world perished once at the beginning of the world in Noah's flood, so too now the world deserves to perish by fire, since the wickedness and injustice are much greater now than what it was then. Then our Lord answered, Since I am just and merciful, I shall make no judgment without mercy nor mercy without justice, and therefore... I will once more send my mercy to the world for the sake of the prayers of my mother and my saints. But if they do not want to listen, the most severe and harsh justice will follow and come to them. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen.